One major unresolved issue of the global financial crisis of 2008 seems to be the determination for the future of the international monetary system, or in layman terms, the way that we handle trading balances globally and the way that we pay each other internationally. Historically, every major financial crisis or social crisis has eventually ended with a redesigning of the international monetary system. Are we indeed today staring down a global financial war? My name is David Accomazzo, adjunct professor of finance at the Grazia Dio School of Business and Management and managing director at Trevino Capital Management. Welcome to Currency Wars, a faculty panel discussion for the Grazia Dio Business Review. Here with me today, a few fellow faculty members, Dr. Peggy Crawford, professor of finance and an expert on a range of topics, including mortgages, closed funds, global currencies, the trade and federal deficits, and the price of oil. Welcome, Peggy. Thank you, David. Edward Fredericks, practitioner, faculty of finance and principal of Iswin Asset Management. Edward has expertise in intelligent database uh, uh, technologies, advanced financial asset valuation, and behavioral issues in financial decision making. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. And Clemens Kalnatsky, adjunct professor and of financial risk management and founder and CEO of FX Investment Strategies, a registered investment advisor. He is also the author of Market Wrap, a regular feature on the Grazia Dio Business Review blog. Welcome, Clemens. Thank you. Well, let's get started. We are in the midst of an international currency war. This is a direct quote by Guido Mantega, the uh, finance minister of Brazil, just a few months ago. He only voiced what has been frequently discussed at every political level behind closed doors uh, about the widespread approach to fix some of the problems resulting from the currency and the financial crisis of 2008 using currency devaluation. Is that true? Are we indeed in the midst of an international currency war, Peggy? There seems to be some evidence of that, um, particularly getting attention, of course, is China and the RMB and what's happening to the value of that. Uh, we do have to recognize that the RMB has been devalued, uh, has appreciated in value something like 20 to 30 percent over the last couple of years, so there has been a significant change in that. Uh, but particularly in the United States, we're the ones that are complaining about the value, and I've heard politicians say it should go down, uh, we should go down against it at least another 50 percent. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, but when you take a look at uh, some of the things that happen to the dollar, there's a lot more than just what's happening with China. Uh, interest rates, for example, interest rates are at an all-time low. Uh, our macro policy with our deficit and the right. world being afraid that uh, we're not going to be able to finance it, and a few other issues. So I think it's much more complex than what we used it to hear. It always is, right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, Clemens, is the relationship between uh, the U.S. and China and the trading balance between the two uh, uh, major economies really at the core of the problem here? Um, well, f stepping back a second here, I, I think war is kind of a strong term. I don't think it's a war, but it is definitely a race, and it's a race to the bottom. <laughs> when you look at the major developed currencies or currencies of the major developed countries, um, you can see a definite trend. And I think that trend started probably in 1985 with the Plaza Accord, um, where the then G5 nations agreed to basically devalue the dollar. Um, and that trend is also correlated in the interest rate. Um, look at the 10-year. Um, 20, 30 years of history, we're really at the bottom right now. And so as a result, the US dollar has a very low kind of yield in terms of um, finding an interest for, for international investors. I think um, there's another aspect, and Peggy brought it up, um, by keeping interest rates low, extremely low, almost to a negative real term yield, um, it's a very handy tool to finance your cost of the debt. And as we know, 14 trillion and some change in uh, public debt, um, that interest cost is significant. Now, imagine we had a couple more percentage interest rates higher. Right. Um, that cost would become unbearable. Um, so I think, and the US is not alone in this game. You know, we have other nations who are 
in a similar situation, but the U.S. is certainly uh, on a fast way to this race to the bottom. So, Ed, can we say that by manipulating uh, perhaps our, our interest rates and utilizing monetary policy very aggressively in the United States, are, are, are we dictating monetary policy and, and, and currencies around the world? Are we the driver of pricing? Well, being that uh, we are the uh, currency of choice, we're the, the, the principal currency for trading, um, I would suggest that uh, our prime motivation is uh, domestic, but uh, of course, uh, being uh, our role in the global economy, we, our uh, domestic monetary policy certainly has effects globally. So um, again, uh, just being the reserve currency, um, the global reserve currency, our actions directly or indirectly affect uh, um, uh, all trading partners in just about every currency in the, on, the, uh, on the globe. Um, but uh, the key is, is that um, where are we supposed to focus? Are we supposed to, supposed to focus domestically as to what uh, monetary policies affect our economy? Or are we supposed to sacrifice our economy for uh, uh, other uh, economies, uh, global growth for other nations. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a, a simple uh, 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 get together and have a short discussion and say, okay, where do you want your currency to be, where vis-a-vis uh, -vis mine, et cetera. Uh, there's quite a lot of dynamics, a lot of, of uh, give and take. So um, I would suggest that uh, the lower interest rates were required by the Federal Reserve to promote and stabilize not only the domestic financial system, but the global financial system. Uh, the key issue is when, uh, when is the global system going to be uh, determined to be steady and interest rates uh, uh, are raised? Well, but Clemens, can we say that we, that we are? the uh, price makers, so should we say that we are the price takers, meaning is, are we uh, dictating what's going on in the international stage uh, by uh, using monetary policy and, and, and low interest rates, or are we just responding potentially to what the Chinese are doing, which are obviously becoming a much more powerful economic force to reckon with? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think that the U.S. is trying to a certain extent dictate monetary global policy. Um, but the significance of, of the U.S. impact on the global stage has definitely depreciated. Um, it, it's not as if we have, we owe some rough ballpark one trillion dollars to the Chinese. Right. Um, I don't like to insult my banker typically because that, that doesn't bode well for my future in terms of asking for more money. Right. Um, so I think the Chinese, in a way, are dictating part of the monetary policy in the world nowadays. And they're doing that um, in a very kind of subtle way. Um, and, and it's been suggested many times that the Chinese have so much invested in the US that they really can't afford not to work with us. Mm -hmm. That's true. But it's also true that the Chinese aren't really helpless in terms of the risk exposure. So yes, they're holding a trillion dollars worth of treasuries. And yes, they're probably holding another trillion dollars of other securities right. in US dollar denomination. They have about $3 trillion worth of foreign currency reserves. But they're not helpless in terms of the market. There are many, many ways in which they can hedge that exposure. And a part of the way that's been shown is in the commodities market. You know, if, the, if everybody knows, everybody agrees that the dollar is declining, uh, why would the Chinese continue to invest in U.S. treasuries? Right. However, they have ways, for instance, they could purchase uh, Australian dollars, they could purchase gold and silver, other commodities. Which to actually they, they, they started to do, is, which they have done. Yeah. I mean, they've been hoarding copper, for, ex right. for example. But, but are the, the markets that large for, for the, those uh, flows that the Chinese uh, would be doing? I mean, uh, by having exposure to the Australian dollar, 
does that uh, inadvertently affect the Australian dollar? And uh, you know, again, one benefit of uh, going into dollars is is the quality of the mi market, Absolutely. the liquidity that's there. But I, I want to go back to something that Ed mentioned a moment ago, uh, that currency policy is really set by what's good for your country. Sure. And that's what's really happening in China. Right. They have to keep the RMB low versus the dollar because we are the major market. They, they don't have choices as to where they're going to sell their goods. Uh, even though they're the number two economy right now, they're very small versus what the U.S. economy is. And so their currency policy is self-preservation of the government because it keeps uh, people working and keeps people happy. Well, of course, that policy, though, does come with a cost. I mean, they, they do import inflation, and right. it comes with a whole mm -hmm. range of ramifications. Are we at that, that sort of that, that point where they may have to start considering a change, which seems like they may have, by, by allowing for the RMB to modestly increase in, in value against mm -hmm. the U.S. dollar? Well, we've seen some of that. They're, they're really trying to establish uh, leadership in Asian right. markets. And with all of the things that have happened to Japan lately, it's uh, right. fairly easy for them to take off. But again, you're talking very small. And by, uh, uh, by keeping it uh, uh, tied to the dollar, they're hurting themselves in Europe because the, the, uh, you know, their value uh, has gone down in there and caused the prices to go up. But then Europe has its problems too, which we can also talk about right. in a minute. But they're still very dependent upon us. And I was reading the other day, it's very interesting what they're doing. They're still purchasing dollars. But to get rid of some of those, they're uh, causing the banks to take them. And that's one of the ways they're you know, lowering the lending uh, mm -hmm. to try to fight inflation. So they're doing kind of a, a circular movement within the country to try to keep the RMB low versus uh, the dollar and still fight inflation. So it's a, a very delicate balancing act they're doing right now. Right. Well, welcome to globalization with everything exactly. is interlinked. But we keep on talking about China, but probably China, obviously, it's the elephant in the room, but it's not really the only one country that has a large trading balance with uh, the Western world. What about all the other emerging markets, uh, um, which have economies that are clearly growing very fast and, and they are accumulating imbalances uh, as well? Is there a sense out there that maybe some of these markets, some of these, for example, the other Asian tigers, are accumulating a lot of dollars as a treasure chest just to sort of avoid what happened in, in, in the 90s. So maybe their accumulation is even beyond uh, what would be a rational sort of a, a, a safety net. Is, is, that, uh, is that a fair assessment of the situation? Are they being irrational or they're, they're just being rational against a potential crisis? Um, I, I think uh, particularly countries like South American countries who've been really uh, I don't know the right word, uh, hammered, uh, I didn't want to use a word that I had in mind, uh, by US dollar loans. When the currency right. decimated, um, they were obliterated, basically. Um, so with that in mind, um, you're very wary of putting all your money in your own domestic currency. Um, so I think what I've seen in countries like Brazil, they're holding a basket of currencies, um, and they are cash cash flow positive, but they're holding a basket of foreign currencies with the view that potentially there's another high inflation crisis coming to their own country. And look at Brazilian right. rates, I and mean, there are double digit rates, right. even though the country is doing so well. Um, so I, I think it's kind capital of... Capital controls now right. also. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So well, this is interesting because now we're talking, we, we mentioned the, the, the Plaza Core, we're talking about holding a, a basket of different currencies. So the system that we've had so far, which was basically a, a system of floating currencies and with, with the dollar at the center of the universe, so to speak, um, are we in danger of having to significantly change the system? Should we be looking at uh, solutions that do not actually take into consideration the continuation of the dollar being the, the center of the universe? Uh, do, do we have any, any plausible alternative here? Well, I think that's something we have to think about. But again, I think that's all down the road, right. uh, many years. 
Um, we keep talking about China, but we have to recognize they have a lot of problems. And, uh, you know, they are the elephant in the room, but they have a lot of problems that they have to solve before we really have to start looking right. at the RMB as an alternative. Uh, you look at Europe, uh, the sovereign debt, you think it's gone and then it pops its head up again. What's going to happen to the European Union? What's going to happen to the European Monetary Union? Uh, there's some people that are saying now Greece has to pull out. Uh, that's the only thing they can do. Is that followed then by Portugal, by Spain? Uh, so we have our problems here, but we're not the only one. And a lot of them we didn't cause. We caused right, some right, of them, right, right. <laughs> okay, but we sure. didn't cause them all. And so I think you you do have financial, maybe not crisis, but significant problems in all of the countries right now. To be uh, responsible for a reserve currency, you also have to have uh, some political will. And you have to look at the political situation uh, in some of these emerging markets that are capital uh, rich, if you will, such as uh, China or Korea. And um, do, do they have the political maturity? Do they have the political apparatus to deal with a global crisis as was done by the West, as was done by the US? You have to admit that some of the things, some of the vehicles, some of the facilities that were put in place, the time, the, uh, the timing of those uh, facilities, how quick they were put in place, the size of them, does anyone else have the uh, uh, maturity, political maturity, the infrastructure, the ability, and also to the confidence uh, of the global system to uh, take on that responsibility. And, uh, you know, I would su suggest that uh, a lot of people would suspect the actions of, uh, of uh, the Chinese political uh, uh, apparatus and that, uh, you know, uh, their decisions, uh, I think, would always be second-guessed. I think um, uh, to have them responsible for global, uh, for global growth would be, uh, uh, would be a very difficult decision for people to make. Well, then that, that raises a good point. So if the dollar is weakening in its role of uh, central role as a currency for the rest of the world, um, if the renminbi is correctly uh, uh, still a little bit mature, and certainly until it gets at least a convertible, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not reasonable to think that it can really take uh, um, you know, the role, the central role. Um, what do we do? I mean, do we stick with the system where we, and, we, and we live with the instability and, and the volatility that, that the floating currency system has brought us, which for some times at the end of the day has worked, has fostered a lot of, uh, a lot of growth for, for decades. So we just live with higher volatility or we look maybe for a multi-currency system, a, 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 different, a different approach, maybe a few voices have been talking about potentially using the SDR, like uh, the, the, the unit of account that the IMF uses internally, maybe uh, take that approach, including gold in the basket. Or, are, are these reasonable ideas at this point? Um, I, I think the ideas are definitely reasonable. Um, I think at this point there's no alternative to the US dollar as a global reserve currency. I just don't see it. Look at the euro, the problems they have at the periphery, right. the club med countries. Mm. A 10 year um, track record really isn't enough to, right, um, right. And, to, and to bring to up your that, confidence. We had, we had the ERM, the exchange rate mechanism that was supposed to bring stability right. to the euro, mm. which it did in certain times. But you, we also remember 1992, that's when I first really got involved in currency trading and the British pound was obliterated within a few weeks. Exactly. Uh, lost 25% of its mm -hmm. value, um, just like that. And the Italian Leo with it. And the Italian Leo <laughs> He was always doing that. Yeah. <laughs> we were doing that on a regular basis. That's so, true. That's so, true. so I really question whether the euro at this point is already the alternative. The Chinese currency is certainly nowhere near that. Um, we're not even talking about freely convertible. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps also, too, we're micromanaging the, the situation in that here we had uh, what people call a five or a six sigma event in financial system. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I think, 
years from now will look back and say we did a fantastic job of wading through it. I mean, we can't expect everything to uh, recover overnight. I mean, people are impatient with the uh, speed of the recovery. But the idea is that we, the system, in my opinion, did work. We did recover. We, the institutions uh, are sound. The government stepped in as the, the buyer, the seller of, of last resort. The Fed stepped in with uh, the asset buying, you know, the quantitative easing to support markets and pricing. So, you know, do we have to sit here and say, well, the system's broken, how do we fix it? Are, are we really getting a little bit too, uh, too um, fixated on the problem versus uh, realizing that um, an economic system is an evolving system. We are globalized let me now, ask you. and it's taking on a, a new shape and form. We might need new facilities, new uh, institutions put in place, but is the basic bones, the infrastructure there, and is it sound? You make an interesting point because you're basically saying the system has survived a, a, an exogenous shock, but you, we could also argue that perhaps the shock came because the system was inherently unbalanced and perhaps wrong. Is mm. there anyone that may want to take that, that side of the trade, so you to know speak? What, in, in terms of you know, um, asset, pricings, I, asset prices always fluctuate. And, and to that point, I think currency prices actually are much less volatile than stocks. If you actually look at the historic volatility True. of currencies, mm -hmm. even Australian dollars and other commodity currencies are less volatile than the S&P 500, certainly less volatile than individual stocks. Mm -hmm. And obviously people are aware of the risks of stocks and the volatility of stocks you to a certain extent. You can just associate volatility with efficiency in pricing as well. So volatility is not necessarily a bad thing. I if agree. the currency markets are volatile, that just shows that perhaps uh, barriers of entry have been struck down. There's more people playing. There's more. Uh, uh, there's better pricing, so there's more volatility. But to David's point, I think we are evolving, and it is a that's moving towards a, oh sorry, and to Ed's <laughs> point, uh, that we are really moving to a global economy. And that's been the difference, and, and that was with the U.S. at the center of the world, right. particularly since uh, World War II, uh, because Europe was devastated, uh, Asia has gone through some really uh, growing pains. So I think what we're going to see is that everything will continue to evolve, I don't think the U.S. will be the sun around which everything else uh, moves, but that's not all bad because if you do have these economic ties and these economic in, uh, dependencies, maybe we're politically a little nicer to each other. Right, that's true. So, that's true. But that might make the next crisis that much harder to, to manage. Well, if it so, comes from us, because that's that's why this one went so global, because it was the United States that started a lot of this, versus the Asian crisis, well, which nobody other than the Asian right. country. Well, made. my point, though, or what I'm trying to say is, as we get more intertwined, and as there are more economic actors on the scene, on the stage, that if we have a crisis such as the one we had before, the USA, uh, you know, New York, the Fed took the leadership role, um, uh, reading some of the, the reports on the facilities that were put in, the lending facilities, a lot of that money went overseas right. to, to European banks, mm -hmm. to support European banks. Um, so my point just is, is that what we have to really be prepared for is that if we have another one of these three, four, five sigma events and not pointing the finger at who's going to cause it or what will cause it, that if there are more key, if the Fed stature is lower and there are more key decision makers, more key economic uh, actors, then coordinating and dealing with all the differing uh, 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 desires, outcomes, will make that uh, uh, process that much more difficult to complete. But I'd say there was a lot of cooperation globally on what was done with this crisis. Right. The sure, U.S. Sure. may have taken the leadership, but there were a lot of meetings and, and trying to coordinate the efforts that 
got us sure. at least this you far out picture, of the hole. You can picture Bernanke saying, if you want a billion dollars, here's what you need to do. <laughs> it's my phone number. <laughs> and, and, and Call so me. We need to talk about it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, uh, but I think, uh, again, the whole idea is that we are evolving. We, we are in unch uncharted waters. And uh, as uh, Dr. Crawford says here, um, you know, being the center of the universe might not be such, might not be a bad idea. Um, we have tremendous human capital, and economic theory states that uh, everyone has their little areas of expertise. Ours is human capital. Perhaps that expertise still will come, uh, uh, will rise to the top in terms of a crisis, right? That, and when I say human capital, I mean the intellect, the experience, the ability to make decisions. And that's a good point. I mean, should we or should we not remain the center of the universe? I mean, in some cases, it's been argued that the fact that the dollar was the reserve currency for the globe brought us uh, great advantages. We may not argue that perhaps those advantages are not there. Maybe we're just bearing some cost and rather than having advantage. So maybe letting that, that role go may actually come with, with some positives uh, in the future. Is that a fair assessment? I think so. Um, the other thing that you also have to remember, when everything fell apart two, three years ago, what did people buy? They bought treasuries, US dollar, mm -hmm. denominated assets, nothing else. So the flight to safety, to me, was the biggest indicator of where the world really thinks right. safety is. Where the confidence is, mm -hmm. yeah. Is that, is, is that also a function, which obviously makes, uh, makes this, the flight to safety a logical choice, but is that because also the United States is still the, the, the largest, more, more deep uh, uh, market? Like the, the, the Europeans, are, unfortunately, don't have a, 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 a euro bond. Should they have one? If, is that but, but you know you can say the treasury was the vehicle of choice, but I guess you could also take a step back and say the dollar the was dollar. the currency yeah, of right, choice. Right, currency right, of choice. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But I think it is because we are the developed uh, economy. Right. Others are developing or have some uh, some problems, some infrastructure problems. So it it was really the only place to go at that right. point in time. Looking forward, that could change. And is it bad or good? We'll have to see. Well, so we talked about the dichotomy between uh, uh, the US dollar and, and the renminbi. Uh, is the euro going to fall apart? Or is the euro going to be a, a, a potential response to, all, to this, a, a third element in, in, in the game? It's an interesting question, because you're looking at what's happening right now. and. Uh, there is a question as to how you are going to sustain at least the European Monetary Union. Right. Because um, the problems in Greece, the problems in Portugal, the problems in Spain, and given the way it's structured, there's limited ability for those countries to react uh, right. and to save themselves. <coughs> so I, I, it's a question. I want to I wanna speak to that point. When I look at currency exchange rates, I always think of an escape valve. It's a valve, you know, there's mm -hmm. pressure building up in the system and the currency rate or the exchange rate is a release valve to release some of that pressure. Um, and in the countries like Greece, that, that escape valve is not there, right? right? So they have their internal problems um, and they can't manage it internally. And at the same, by the same token, China has a similar problem, right? They're essentially quasi-pegged again with the U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. and they really import inflation. Um, we've had what 11 percent right. food inflation last month. Um, they raised the reserve requirements for the fifth time, yeah. over 20, 21 percent, I believe it is now in, in China. Um, and their rate four times. Right, and by the way, Michael Pettis was the expert on the ground in, right. in China. has been uh, writing extensively and saying that notwithstanding the fact that there are all these this attempts at cooling up the economy and, and inflation, that is actually pushing the system to what we have done uh, running up to the, the days of the crisis, a proliferation of this uh, uh, of the shadow banking system okay. where actually the liquidity is being provided in in ways that it's even more difficult to track so they're not really slowing down anything right. apparently right mm -hmm. 
right? So, so by, by looking at this, I think um, in hindsight, actually China has done a remarkable job man managing its currency. And the way I know it, the way I feel I know it is, um, in a way, it was the most obvious trade you could do as a trader, saying, well, everybody knows that the yuan will appreciate 20, 30, 40% right. was mm -hmm. kind of the, the token figure. And yet you couldn't profit from it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they had all these restrictions in place. Yeah. And if you went through non-deliverable forwards and other uh, financial instruments, the pricing of that was just not good enough to take advantage or take any profits from that most obvious trade. So I think in a, you know, by then, that kind of measure, I would say China has done a remarkable job managing their currency. Um, but I think and reducing speculation. Reducing speculation. Mm -hmm. and, but I think it's also in their best interest to gradually appreciate their currency because food inflation is a political issue. Right. It, it creates political unrest, and that's the last thing China wants. Right. Absolutely. The, the political situation is really so important when you discuss currency. Right. And you, you talk about Greece uh, and the problems with Greece. Really, they just don't have the political uh, ability to deal with it. And when they uh, started reducing some of the federal spending there, what happened? There was riots in the streets. People were killed, right? And if you look at some of the policies that the government has uh, have, have uh, put into place uh, retirement at 55. Right. I, I, I mean, you know, they really do have to rein in the spending, right. but uh, no one there has the political willpower or the political power in general. Uh, it's a fractured uh, uh, political system that um, you know they've gotten themselves in this in this uh, problem, and they just can't get out. So uh, the perhaps they have to be let. Loose. Well, the question is, how long is Germany going to continue to bail out the rest of the support yeah. the countries? And that's, I think, they're beginning to kind of step back from that and say, wait a minute. So, but so is is the situation now pushing? Uh, the, the probabilities are more that the, the euro will be pushed t towards some kind of disintegration, or more um, actually pushing them to a more uh, uh, union, more fiscal union internally, more regulatory union to. Because the political will of, of, of you know, we created the, the European Union and eventually the common currency to overcome centuries of, of massacres and wars. Is that, a, at the end of the day, a, a major point that, that people will, will go for? Or at the end of the day, instead, it comes down to, um, you know, the daily economics of, of each country in each region. Yeah. Of nationalistic, nationalistic uh, policy yeah, exactly. and interests. Yeah. Right, right. What, what do you think, Clemens? I, I think um, the Euro experiment um, has, <laughs> has gone very far. And I think it has gone so far that the core countries, um, France, Germany, Holland, um, cannot afford to abandon the Euro right. at this point. So, so I think what may happen is that we have a two-tier Euro currency system mm -hmm. with the core countries, Northern and Central Europe being the core or the Euro, the, the A shares of the Euro with uh, Club Med countries, the periphery countries, um, kind of the B shares in the Euro experiment. Um, it's my personal opinion. Was the original intent of the Euro, Euro to promote economic growth and to uh, ease trade restrictions among the European uh, countries? If that was, then po possibly what uh, uh, will come out of this is maybe not a two-tiered Euro, but some type of uh, hybrid European Union where you do have uh, uh, the ability to control your own destiny, per se, with your own central bank. But there is some type of trade currency that still promotes the free flow, the free flow of goods and that efficiency that one currency brings uh, throughout the European Union. So, you know, I wonder if you can have the good and the good versus the good and the bad, you know? So it would be interesting. Well, to they're see. either going to have to step in and really jump in and become a united area. Are right. we're going to see them break. And what do you think about the UK? 
how, never mind, let me say it a little differently. <laughs> and particularly, uh, keeping the pound, how does this, doesn't it really in some ways undermine uh, the idea behind uh, the European Union and the Euro? Well, the British are, have always been eccentric. Um, and and it's, it's an island, so yeah. that geographically separates them from Europe. Mm, um, but half the island is in the Union, right? Well, <laughs> kind of, yeah. yeah. So, so I'm not sure if, um, if the UK is actually a great example. We have another island, Switzerland, that stayed out exactly. of Europe. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for better or worse, they're laughing now, but for a long time, Switzerland has been suffering. Sure. Um, because all of the trade routes were circumventing that island. Um, and, and my brother, for example, does logistics, and he works in Switzerland, lives in Germany, just across the border. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's seen a huge problem in the previous years, just in terms of transport, because Switzerland was that island inside the European Union. And there was almost a sort of ganging up on Switzerland kind of mm. notion of they didn't want to join us, so let's forget about them. We'll trade oh, okay. oh. with Italy, but we're not going through Switzerland. Mm, interesting. I've always suspected that of the Europeans. <laughs> 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 well, as we, I guess, navigate through these troubled waters and we're trying to find uh, uh, solutions or at least uh, a little adjustments, is, is there any uh, place for gold in, in, in this particular process? Obviously, the markets have, have been quite bullish in, in that regard. Is I that have, market right? I have very, very strong feelings on gold. And, I know um, you're doing That's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> and my, my, or looking my way, right? <laughs> well, my feelings on gold is that it's an ornamental metal. And it's pretty, it's shiny, and it makes wonderful, wonderful jewelry. But to base your economy's uh, value, your worth, on a physical, a physical asset, let alone gold, um, I think is ludicrous in this day and age. I think that, uh, um, geez, you know, if you look at a country and a country's bonds or promise to pay is, is supported by gold or only supported by gold and um, I think is, is really draconian. And if you look at it, everyone, every consumer out there has a credit card. And that credit card is backed by the promise to pay. So we will let an average person have credit, but yet we're not going to let a country, a sovereign country, have credit. They have to have gold to back their bonds, their currency. It just, to me, doesn't make sense. So uh, I am very, very much uh, in favor of, oh, and one last point, one very important point. Where is gold? It's in the ground somewhere. Okay, so say you do have reserves uh, uh, that are largely gold, and that is what makes your currency strong. Suppose Russia finds uh, this huge, huge uh, um, vein of gold, or a country in Africa, and they flood the market with gold. What happens then to your uh, reserves? They now become worthless. So I mean, to no, have I have to gold, agree with really, you. That really, you know. You're, you're letting yourself uh, uh, be, um, um, be um, uh, affected by all these external forces that you can't. You well, can't, a traditional uh, gold, gold standard, I would agree with you that it would be completely unthinkable. But how about maybe taking clues from where the market is pricing gold as a way of maybe uh, fine-tuning monetary policy? Um, I also have very strong feelings and opinions on gold. Um, oh, here we are. Now we got into the, to the heat of the, of the yes. discussion. Yeah. <laughs> to me, gold is just a fiat currency as anything else. Because mm -hmm. um, it is valuable because we believe it's valuable. Right. It's really yeah, a exactly. piece of exactly. metal, yeah. right. shiny. And the ornamental and some industrial use is, is creating some, some value in that metal. Um, but I don't think going back to a sort of gold standard makes any sense. Just there's this neat website where you can actually put in some numbers, and I've, I've done that a couple of days ago. So if you take the US current GDP, 14 and some trillion chains, um, uh, you look at the price of gold 
14 trillion dollars is 168 percent of all the gold that's ever been found in, mm -hmm. at this price, at $1,500 an ounce. If you take 2009 figures of the world GDP of $60 trillion, you come up with a value of $10,000 pounds of gold. Right. That's about as much gold as we ever found. Right. So that's one year's worth of global GDP. So how is this going to work? Are we going to see a gold price of $50,000, $100,000? Is that manageable? Does that make sense? I don't think so. Right. And then have it earmarked. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, I think also, too, this whole idea of going to gold. Would you like to say something? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting the, the old kick under the table here. Um, uh, you know, I think it's just hideous that people in times of, uh, of uh, danger, in times of high risk, they go to gold. Because a as you pointed out, and as I agree, it's an ornamental metal. You can't eat it, right? right? It doesn't protect you. Right. So, you know, I have always thought that in times of uh, extreme uncertainty, I think it would be better to have uh, a case of beans and a shotgun than a pound of gold. Cigarettes. Uh, uh, cigarettes are, right, and right. nylon stockings, right? <laughs> Always a good currency. <laughs> Going back to something that makes sense, uh, when uh, Clements, you said gold has value because we perceive it has value. But that's what currency is. Correct. The dollar has value because people ha have a perception that it has value. Why does it have value? Because the, the government has the right to tax its citizens right. to pay the bills. And so, you know, it's interesting that, that it's always the perception. And what's changed in the last couple of years about the perception of the dollar? But that's, I think that ties in with, for example, Robert Zolik has been saying. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the head of the World Bank and he's been vocal about not going back to gold standard, of course, but maybe including gold as a, as a thermometer. Uh, within the context of maybe using uh, special drawing rights or some kind of a basket, trying to take into consideration what the market perception is of monetary policy and potential inflationary expectations. Wouldn't that be maybe just one way of including uh, uh, the metal as, as part of a, of, a, of a solution? Some type of pricing index uh, that includes other commodities. Right, because at the end of the one thing that, that people seem to to like about gold is the fact that it's it's there. It's it's a finite amount, and so I think that's why it it it, it, it works well in certain times because right. you can't really the perception. I agree with you that we it's like another fiat currency. We agree that we like gold and we'll accept it for payment. Right. Uh, but in the case of the dollar, we can print as much as we want. In the case of the renminbi, they can manipulate. Uh, in the case of the Italian lira, of course, <laughs> it was a constant devaluation. Gold is a little bit more difficult to manipulate. It can still be manipulated, I mean, uh, like, like anything else. But maybe it does create a little bit of a break uh, in the process. But as Ed said, there may not be a finite amount that at any point in time you could find maybe huge there's amounts. synthetic gold down the road yeah and uh, true it, it's interesting because in my class yesterday someone said why is gold always the currency right because it has been it's sort of like history right so why gold more mm -hmm. than sure. silver sure. or copper or why not tulips well, at well, one, I guess one point we, in time. We tried that one <laughs> yeah. soon. Right, it didn't work that way. Which, well. which, well. which gets me to an interesting point as to why that basket might not work or why that basket would probably create more pricing problems than benefits. And uh, if you look at uh, asset bubbles, uh, a lot of asset bubbles are caused by um, liquidity. That's one key issue. But they're also caused by the inability to determine intrinsic value and the inefficiency of information flow, meaning that rumors are rife as to new finds, as to supply and demand that affect the pricing. So if we're using any type of basket of commodities to help us price currencies, that pricing, I think, could be very, very, very volatile as bubbles start from just innuendo, from the inability to really gauge demand. If you go back to the oil uh, uh, crisis, some of the things you heard uh, were what? 
oh, we burn 87 million gallons uh, uh, of fuel a day or a year or a month, and we're only bringing, we're only refueling or bringing up out of the ground 85. So of course, it's going up and it's only going up from here. Meanwhile, what's really happening is that offshore, there's just tankers full of oil sitting there as people try to arbitrage the market. So again, one of the problems with bubbles is information flow. And I think that would cause the pricing of a commodities basket just to be overly volatile and to really not prove to be very useful at all in terms of currencies. There's, there's another issue I have with the commodity type of basket. Um, we live in a digital age. Um, a currency is a digital commodity in a sense that I can just do an, a paper entry and transactions exactly. are done. Right. Um, mm -hmm. How do I do a credit in gold? How do I do a credit in silver or copper with another bank overseas? So I think the better alternative, if there is some sort of a basket, it would be currency baskets. I and agree. that's been done by many central banks and many sovereign um, institutions. How they peg their own how currencies. How they peg their own, yeah. how they manage their own risk mm -hmm. through holdings in different currencies. I think that's a more viable solution. I, I agree. If we go to a basket that I see at currencies and not having the hard currencies, okay. uh, the commodities, and, and you made a really good point. Not only is it a digital economy, but it's a 24 hour a day right. uh, worldwide. And so to be able to move currency quickly, you have mm -hmm. to be able to do it. Yeah. Because the paper money is such a tiny bit of the money. Right. So I, I think that's a good point. Well, Ad, do you have some final comments on the future of the international monetary system? Um, well, I uh, am very tempted to uh, quote Keynes at this point, <laughs> but uh, that's of course an, you can't uh, have it, and I can have it without quoting Keynes. Yeah, but that's that's an overly played <laughs> quote, so uh, I won't uh, go there. But uh, one thought I do have is that there is uh, an economic doctrine called financial liberalization, and financial liberalization means that for a country to efficiently utilize capital. Uh, externally as well as internally, they must liberalize their uh, uh, financial system, their, uh, uh, their uh, fiscal policies, and um, break down any barriers of capital flows in and out of the country. Financial liberalization uh, uh, produces uh, uh, funds based more on supply and demand versus uh, artificial barriers put up by taxation or whatever. The problem, though, then, is that speculative forces come in uh, and they find uh, areas where the returns are attractive and they overwhelm the system, right? And these small emerging markets, which are implementing financial liberalization policies right now, such as Brazil, they let their guard down, they bring in, they let this capital come in, and uh, as it turns out, it's very speculative. And as soon as either the growth rates or the returns drop, that capital is quick to, to leave, leaving these poor countries in a lurch and uh, in need of capital to, to maintain their policies. So I think the real key issue here with some of the emerging markets, with some, and even with China, if you think about it, they're still in a process of liberalizing, financially uh, liberalizing their economy, is how do you let uh, your barriers down uh, for the efficient flow of capital, yet how do you still stop all these speculative forces which can really um, uh, wreck may uh, bring in mayhem into your uh, economic policies and plans for, for, for growth. So I think that's really the key uh, uh, issue that's going on. Um, how do we ensure the efficient flow of capital around the globe, yet still uh, maintain um, uh, control and uh, prevent uh, the damage from speculative forces? Thank you. I'll be a little more concise. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, we've gone through a couple of very interesting years. Um, I hope we never go through years Same like again. that again. But I do think the financial markets, currencies, everything will continue evolving. And it may start moving more quickly than we have in the past. Uh, I think we're moving towards a global economy of some sort. 
Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Federal Reserve unwinds their positions. And I think a lot of, of what people think about us is going to depend upon how successfully they get rid of all those assets. So I think it's an interesting time. It's, uh, we're observing. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but I'm always hopeful. Clement? Um, I believe in terms of interesting times, uh, let's wait until June when uh, QE2 um, ends. ends. Um, that also looks, as a chartist, I look at, let's say, a 20, 30 year history of the 10 year Treasury bill, but that is really a downward sloping trend and um, we're near the bottom. Uh, the question is, can we go any further um, knowing that large institutions like PIMCO have gone short on the U.S. Treasury. Um, of course, they used to say that in Japan also. For many right, years. they <laughs> said that in lower, Japan lower, and, lower. And, and can't go lower, and it, right. it was. And interestingly enough, the Japanese yen has appreciated right. against exactly. went to a record mm -hmm. high against the dollar. Mm -hmm. so and that's why you're buying lunch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> very good point. So I, I, I think we're in very interesting times. Um, and I also agree that the economic system globally will evolve faster than we've seen it in our lifetime. Certainly. Um, yeah. Because it's a digital age. And uh, talking about crises, if you look at the history of crises, I think they're also more frequent. You know, we may have another five sigma events, uh, another several five sigma events in our lifetime, mm -hmm. and they should never, never ever have happened in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's very interesting. It's also um, exciting in a sense that as an investor, um, you are forced to deal with the world. You cannot say, I'm just a US domestic investor. That mm -hmm. time is done. That's over. You have to have a global outlook because, as we can see, the S&P 500 companies generate, what, 50% of their profits overseas okay. now. The right? last two years have mm. been stupendous right? in terms so, of so you foreign say, profits. We, we are big enough as a country to have an economy that's self-sufficient, in theory, but I think we cannot afford not to look elsewhere and be aware of it. Well, this is all we have time for today. I would like to thank my panelists for their participation and their insight to today's topic. And I would like to thank you for joining us for Currency Wars. And I would like to invite you to continue the debate online at gbr.pepperdine.edu. And for the Greta Dio Business Review, this is David Akumatsa signing off.